Namaskaram. Well, uh, you know, what a great uh, suit to follow post Dr. Sunil, right? Made with all that laughter. Uh, when we were growing up, we were told that, you know, do not exercise after eating because everything may just come out. But I think all that came out was the lethargy, uh, you know, typically what happens, you know, there's one commonality between uh, Malayalis and Bengalis. Not one, there are many. Besides the fact that we both come from coastal regions, fish is our delicacy, education is our right, communism is our ethos, which I hope is changing now. We love rice. A life without rice is just absolutely uh, you know, unimaginable for Malayalis and Bengalis. And what happens after rice is you feel sleepy. So in Bengal, after 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., every shop used to be closed until just last one year. It was the right to sleep, the right to eat, the right to education, and the right to sleep. We felt that it was an inherent thing in us. So I think doc what Dr. Sunil did was like he ensured he said that forget about that right for some time. Let's have the right to knowledge, the right to feel empowered. So. Firstly, thank you so much to Chandra and her absolutely wonderful team who has passionately put together this summit and what a great summit it is, right? Um, we grew up with the Guru Sishya Parampara, right? Our Guru is the epitome of knowledge or rather next to God. If you ask me, a child after she turns three, or he or she turns three and four, spends most of their time with their Guru which is the trainer, whatever you want to call it, the educationist, than they do with their parents. Eight to nine long hours in school is what they spend, right? Because they believe that harnessing the knowledge is the best way to live a better and a more fulfilled life. Therefore, the importance and the necessity of such a summit. So while Chandra talked about all the things I do, one of the things I do is I study, I read and write on the Vedas. I believe that it's very, very integral to understand the fundamentals that lie in the science of Vedas and Upanishads. And one of the things that I've learned, or rather every time when I was growing up, I've learned doing is, before you do Naman to your Guru, you wake up in the morning, you look at your hand, right? Well, I don't have a place like Dr. Sunil to keep it here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna use somehow here and there, and I'm gonna talk about it, is that your, no matter what an astrologer, no matter what anybody or a palmist or, or a tarot card reader has told you, remember the ability for you to change your future lies in your hand. Karagare vasate lakshmi, karamadhe saraswati, karamule sthite gaudi, prabhate karidarshanam. If these are the three things you say every morning, which means it is in my hand and my hand alone is the ability to work hard, to strive for better, to acquire knowledge and therefore gain money. Money is a byproduct, right? It automatically comes with education. A lot of people have talked about, you know, what is, what is real education? There's a fine line being between being literate and educated. Today when I was in the fly, there was a gentleman who was sitting next to me and uh, he saw me reading an article uh, on a particular site, and I, I contribute to uh, you know this this site on a regular basis. I write articles. He asked me, "So what do you do?" I said, "I pass on knowledge." He said, "What? No, no. What is your degree? What do you do? What do you do for a living?" I said, "I pass on knowledge." He said, "You must be kidding me." I said, "Why?" He said, no, who can earn money by, earning, by passing knowledge? What does that mean? It's very vague. I'm like, sir, you wouldn't be seated in this plane today next to me if that guru of yours did not take the earnest inclination towards you to pass on knowledge and make you who you are. So start by being grateful. So give a big round of applause to all the gurus for whom you're seated here today. Because somebody took the time out beyond their life, beyond their, their uh, you know, uh, implications to make sure that they impart knowledge in you. People look at my card and say, you know, Dr. Shom. So what, are you a medical doctor? I said, no, no, I'm a PhD. Okay, from where? You know, sometimes these questions are irrelevant. The truth about education is 
is not just it makes you differentiate between cause and effect, helps you decide between right and wrong. The truth of education is that it makes you enlightened. It makes you humble. It makes you eligible to earn a living without depending on a job. That is the real value of education. If education and training is just to make you job ready, then this country, which has been invaded over thousands and thousands of years, and we keep saying that we are a services country, we are a services country, we are not becoming a product country, and I am here to talk about digital, let me tell you something. It is Aryabhatta who invented zero is why digital even exists today, so be grateful. If he did not invent the zero, digital, which is a binary of zero and one, wouldn't even exist today. Yes, we were an extremely culturally, educationally, resource-rich country. Is why we were invaded again and again, and we lost a little in the way. But we, when we bend down and do namaskara, let not somebody think that is your weakness. Being humble is the biggest strength. So when you bend down, it is a show of respect and show of humility, and that's what education does to us. That's the beauty of education. Just having degrees make you literate. And the problem with literacy is that the moment somebody doesn't give you a job, you become paranoid. My dad's a psychiatrist. Both my parents are doctors. My dad's a psychiatrist. And trust me, when I decided not to become a doctor, and I know you won't believe, in the family that I come from, where everybody has, like, you know, everybody is into the field of medicine, I said, I want to do management, or rather marketing, to be very precise. My dad said, you've gone mad. Are you going to go door to door and sell things? Are you mad? You come from a family of doctors. You're going to go door to door and sell things and think. That, that's, that's the imagination, right? Parents are grooming their children to become doctors and lawyers and so-called labeled professionals. And when they're doing that, a lot of artists are getting lost. A lot of creative people are getting lost. A lot of authors are getting lost. I'm sure when, you know, Dinah was getting groomed by her parents, not, they didn't tell you become an author, right? Nobody does. That's the problem. That's why we're making our kids job ready. And why am I talking about this? The power of digital is to disable that. Is to disable you from just thinking about education as a medium to earn money. Digital transforms you and makes you willed enough to believe that education is about creating jobs for others. Education is about becoming self-empowered. Education is about sharing with 10 other people and making them empowered. That is the reality of education. Education is not a degree, because trust me, when you don't have a job, nobody cares about the degrees that you have earned. When a company decides to lay off, and yesterday itself, I wrote a big article in Times of India about Snapdeal. All of you know Snapdeal? Do you know how many people they are laying off? Six to seven hundred people. And trust me, a lot of them are going to hit depression. The rate of depression amongst youth in India has gone up between 2001 to 2016 by 38%. Now, everybody questions, right? Given that there are so many new mediums of education, digital has come in, so many things are happening, why is depression at such a high rate? is because the curriculum in the system of education is not changing with the changing needs of the jobs, with the changing needs of an entrepreneur, with the changing needs of a startup. None of that is happening. Today, why I give kudos to Chandrana team is why bringing in trainers of diverse nature is so important is because one needs to see beyond the nomenclature of what you learn in just your schools and colleges. People who are studying engineering, you read, you, you read a subject called strength of material. Trust me, no engineering job that's going to ever come across your way is going to use that subject. Well, it, I'm not saying it's not important. Yes, it's important to learn. Just like your parents taught you some important things to learn. 
Just like in, 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 in a Muslim family, it's important to know how to do nawaz. Now, is it essential for you to do that in job? No, it's not. That's a part of your culture. You should pay importance to it. Yes, the Christians have to go to church because that's a part of your culture. You need to respect that. But it's not the Bible that makes you job ready. It's not the Bible that makes you completely aware of what you ultimately are going to do when it comes to skills. You need to pay respect to your culture. But you need to learn the importance of using what is going to ultimately make you sustainable and self-empowered. And what I mean by self-empowered is very simple. I will not graduate out of my college with a certificate that is going to define my life. No, I'm going to graduate out of college with skills that's going to shape my future. Can we agree to that? And those skills are not only just in the hands of the trainers alone. It is a self-introspection process. So don't be scared to sit with your parents and ask them to help you and handhold you and ask you questions or rather question them and ask them, why are you asking me to take up engineering if I don't believe I can be a great engineer? Why should I practice medicine when I know I'm not going to be a good doctor? Why can't I pick up a paintbrush, paint well, so that I can get remunerated in millions, get applauded across the world, and maybe one day my painting will make a place next to Leonardo Vinci's in Louvre in Paris. Why not? If all of you guys, I don't know how many of you have read the Gita, but let me tell you something. Even in Gita, Krishna, who we believe in, in, amongst Hindus, is, he was incarnation of Lord Vishnu, doesn't tell Arjun to do something. Gita is a question and answer. Arjuna keeps asking Krishna questions because he wants clarifications. He doesn't believe that everything that is in front of him is the truth and truth alone. So he keeps questioning him. And he keeps asking him, tell me why should I do this? Tell me why not? And at the end of the Gita, the shloka, I'm going to just say what it means in English. It's Krishna says this, see, I have given you and told you all that I know of does not mean I know it all. I will leave it to your best judgment to decide what is best for you. So your parents, your gurus, you yourself are going to have a plethora of experiences through the rest of your life. But you have to choose what is best for you. Don't blame somebody else for your destiny. And one thing I will tell you, every morning, get up, stand in front of the mirror, and talk to yourself. If you don't, you'll miss out meeting a wonderful person in this world. Instead of emulating others, look at yourself and try to be the best example that you can be. That's very important. So coming to digital, you know, why is digital shaping the world? Why is digital transforming the world? I run a trust. The trust is called a Center for Entrepreneurial Excellence. You know, I spent many years um, in the field of marketing and management and strategy, and I've headed strategy for very large companies like Verizon, Red Hat. One fine day, and let me tell you, I used to make a lot of money. One fine day, it was like a wake-up call. Did I want to go back into that AC room every day, look at the computer, look at a bunch of emails and answer them, sometimes without applying logic because I have to answer them. Because there is a decorum, there is a discipline, there is a process that I have to follow. I question myself. Was I built? Was I made? Was I honed to just follow a method without questioning it? Or was I made to disrupt? Not very far from here is Kanyakumari. And trust me, I come there every year. I, I, I may not have the opportunity to sit at the rock where Vivekananda sat himself for meditation, but I sit in the room where his, his idol is there, and I sit and I meditate there, and I ask, what did you find here that changed your life? And I do that every year because I find something new every year. Evolution 
is the only constant in humans. You evolve. Swami Vivekananda was a very ordinary student. I don't know how many of, knew, of you know, he never got more than 47% in his school and college. Never. He somehow scraped to pass. He lost his dad at a very young age and his name was Narendra Nath Datta. They were a big zamindar, what you call as a very large bureaucratic family. Had a lot of money, but with the death of the father, they lost everything. And what do you learn from that? That nothing is constant. Just because you have something today, don't get comfortable because you may lose it tomorrow. So learning, why I say that I do not believe in the concept of degrees and certificates is because it makes you comfortable. It makes you lethargic. You stop pursuing the road of excellence. So Swamiji, when he lost his father, he lost his mojo. He lost his enthusiasm to pursue something. And one fine day he heard about this mad God believer called Ramakrishna. And he said, okay, I'm going to go meet him. I want to know why my life is like this. Everybody says he's seen God. I want to go meet him. So he went and met Ramakrishna and he said, he asked him this question. Have you seen God? He didn't ask, is there God? He, and why I say this is that every individual you meet in your life, give them a benefit of doubt. Don't judge anyone. If somebody says they have done something and they can help you, open yourself up for that. Don't believe in hearsay. Don't believe what you've heard from others. When you've come here today, don't just listen to the people who are standing on the stage. We are not exceptional than you are. We all are born with the same brain capacity and science proves that. It's just that few of us use it more than the others. Which means all of us are born exceptional. It is you who choose to be ordinary. So the choice is in your hand. So don't just listen to people like us. All those people who are seated next to you, get to know them. It's the value of your network, it's the value of your relationship that is going to cost you in your life ultimately. It is that what is going to last your lifetime, nothing else. And that's education, learning about each other. So when Swamiji asked Ramakrishna, have you seen God? He gave him the benefit of doubt that maybe this man has seen God. He was, he was not sure, but he gave him the benefit of doubt. And he said, if you have seen God, then show him to me. If you have seen, show him to me. So when you're seated next to someone and you want to know about them, learn about them, ask them what they're great at, what they feel they're good at. And they say, if you know that well, then can you teach me too? Don't shy away from learning just because you're an engineer. Think today, almost 67 to 70 percent of those who qualify from engineering end up doing a marketing or a management. If you believe that engineering was the ultimate, then why do you need management skills? The question, right? In 1920s, MBA was not a curriculum. People had to work for years to become MBAs. It used to take them time. So experience would make somebody a management expert. They would grow, grow to become a manager after several years of experience. Then people realized that why to wait 10 or 15 years if I can teach this to someone? And that's what a trainer comes into play. It was a trainer, he was a management guru, who ultimately created the curriculum of NBA and said, let somebody who has the right inclinations, skills, learn it from day one. So you don't have to wait 10, 12 years to become a manager. You can become one if you are able to impart the skills, if you are able to inculcate the skills by learning. Just like that, entrepreneurship became a curriculum in Babson. And, and it started growing. So people believed that skills could be converted into curriculum, could be imparted in people and individuals, and you can shape their life. So what Ramakrishna did was he held Swami Vivekananda's hand and said, not only will I show you God, I will give you the power to change people's lives. And guess what? Everybody believes that a Swami or rather, you know, a priest or someone, he, he, he lives a completely holy, like, you know, untouchable, undoable life. No, no, no. 
You have to experience everything to know what not to do. Swamiji, when he was in Varanasi, he was in Varanasi, and why am I talking about this? Is you have to understand the relation between that and how digital is going to transform your life. So today you are connected with thousands of people on Facebook. How many of you have a LinkedIn account here? Just raise your hands. Almost 80% of you have a LinkedIn account. How many of you have over 500 connections on LinkedIn? How confident are you amongst all those of you who have raised your hands that if you were not doing what you're doing today, if somehow your steady income comes to a stop, these connections that you have will immediately help you find something that will help you lead a sustainable life. One, two, three, four, five. You know what that means? It just shows the shallowness that exists in us in our relationships. It just looks good to have 500 plus connections, right? It's a power, I got something, it's an achievement, just like a degree, it's an achievement. What did you do with it? Nothing. How many times do you reach out to those people and ask them how they're doing, what they're doing in their life, congratulate them on their work anniversary or even an accomplishment they've done? No. When one day you will fall flat on your face, will then you remember the need for these people and then when you reach out to them, they will not care. Why would they care when you only need, reach out to people in terms of need? And that's the beauty between, you know, that's something that's, that doesn't exist between a trainer and a, and a learner, right? Because in a guru and a sishya, it's not just give and take of a certain format. The guru looks at sishya and says, you are finally the carrier of the knowledge that I have given you and you're going to change the world tomorrow. And my legacy will be through the work that you do. When we build relations on LinkedIn, on the Facebook, when you talk about digital transformation, when you talk about changing the world through digital education, ideally, all these connections that you have should be able to add value to your life in some way or the other. If you have a group of people in your LinkedIn connection who are, let's say, from a, from a certain financial or, let's say, FSDC, some BFSI background, and you know that that part has a role to play in your career, you should ideally be able to reach out to them meet up with them and see how you can learn those skills. If you have a group of trainers, educationists, what are their expertise? What do they train on? LinkedIn is very popular for education curriculum, right? So you know Coursera. How many of you have heard of Coursera? How many of you have taken a course on Coursera? Four or five of them. Let me tell you something. 35% of the courses that are provided on Coursera are for free. And out of those 35%, 30% of the courses are offered free by Ivy League universities. So your dream to become an Ivy Leaguer is just a click away. The question is, did you make that effort? You are so busy liking the posts of your friends and your relatives that you lost time to use digital to discover a new dimension of your life. And that's what I said. Evolution is the only constant in human's life. And if you did not evolve with the advent of tools and technologies, then all that you did was, you believed ignorance was bliss, and I believe ignorance is an act of foolishness. It's only a fool who decides to ignore. And that's the difference between you were born exceptional and you decided to be ordinary, because you decided to ignore the exceptional capabilities that already existed in you. Now digital. Why I talked about Swamiji and why I talked about, you know, why do I go and sit in the rock is that, you know, when Swamiji started traveling the world, right, he used to feel very disturbed. He used to feel that people are difficult to change. And with my knowledge alone, I cannot change people. I can't. They would want to have to be open to change. It is not a one-sided, one-handed effort. Like Sir said, it takes two to clap, it takes two to tango, it always takes two to come together to make something beautiful happen. Even you pray with two hands, it is not one. Whether it's to Allah, whether it's to Jesus, whether it's to any God in the world, it is with two. That's the power. It takes your mind and your ability to open up and to make something happen. When Swamiji was traveling and he felt that, you know, he was frustrated, he had given up. He said, I can't do this anymore. 
And that's why he came to the end of India after traveling everywhere. The most beautiful place. I think this is, a, this is the biggest spiritual hub that you guys have. And I, 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 you know, I feel that there's a reason it exists, right? It it's, it's exists for one's ability to introspect and ideate and understand where they truly belong. So when he came here, three days, all he did was cry. He just cried for three days. Sometimes it's okay to cry. A tear in a man's eye is not a sign of weakness, just like a tear in a woman's eye is not a sign of weakness. Just like a man is meant to do a certain task, remember one thing for all the ladies in the room, a woman is a womb plus a man. We have the power to give life, we have the power to procreate. The biggest power lies in us. So if you feel, in your, if you feel that you can impart certain things in the man in your life, don't shy away. It is always important to have two, to make a cohabited learning experience exist. It's very, very important. So he gave up. He said, I can't do this anymore. I can't change people's life. They, want to, they have, to, have to want to do it themselves. And he cried, he cried, he cried, and he realized, just because there has been downfalls, you can't give up. All power lies within yourself. You can do anything and everything was a realization he had at the Vivekananda Memorial Rock. He said, I will stop blaming others for my shortcomings, for my downfalls. I will continue to do what I have to do. People will change. And trust me, that yogi, that Swami today is still celebrated across the world. Chicago has a lane dedicated in his name just because that man did not give up. And you celebrate him, you worship him, you pray him. Thousands of visitors flock everywhere in the world to celebrate his, uh, his birth anniversary. People come to celebrate in the mem Memorial Rock. But he was not a graduate with 95.5 percentile. He did not crack the cat. He did not go to any IIM. He did not do any of that. He decided. I am not going to let my shortcomings ever tell me that I am incapable of anything. And that's what we educationists are supposed to do. Digital has the power to do two things. It reduces the gap between two people. It gets two people closer. So it gives you access to people, to educational curriculum, to universities, to skills you never had access to otherwise 20 years back. So how are you going to leverage it? You are going to not just, I'm saying it's not that you don't need to socialize, it's important to socialize. But if you spend 90% of your time Facebooking, take 50% of that time and discover courses that's going to make you less redundant, more skilled, more self-empowered and you have to stop depending on the jobs that you have in the market today. So nobody can say if thousands of people are getting laid off, your life is not going to get impacted because of those thousand people. You will still continue. And guess what? How do we do that? So when I started my trust, we are the biggest, so Anspan is the biggest partner of Google in India. So we won their black box challenge in 2014. So we use the developer's tool sets to actually crawl over all public profile of people. So I can tell what, sir, you do online? What are the things you like? What are the things you don't like? Because digital makes your life an open book. I can do all of that. And you know why? Because when you were signing on to Gmail or you were signing on to Facebook, you forgot to read the terms and conditions because it was a long list, right? How many of you have ever read the terms and conditions in Google and Facebook? We just do a quick, you know what it says? One of the paragraphs says that they can use their da your data for the purpose of research and share it with their partners for the purpose of research and can be used for all marketing and ad activities. You didn't read it. We made money out of it. Simple. But we didn't want to stop there. We said, how do we empower people in rural India? 65% of India's youth is under the age of 35. What a young country we are. But for every 14 that graduates, only one gets a job. What a redundant country we are. Such a youthful country, yet so redundant. So we changed that. We said, we're going to change that. So how digital transforms people's life? We made all this 
you know, you would have heard of Google Ad was the Google certification program, which usually only people in the urban sector, you know, affiliate to. We said, we're going to make that available to all the rural guys. We're going to break the language barrier. What is the biggest weakness most of us suffer from? A lot of people say mother tongue influence, right? Language is a constraint. You may be a very smart guy, but because you can't speak English well should not define whether you should get a job. And a lot of people who get rejected at a job interview is because they can't speak the foreign language well. I'm sure Dina is affluent in her own languages and she speaks English, English fabulously. I speak Bengali fabulously, I speak Kannada fabulously, I speak five other languages very well, including French, because I want to learn. Now think about it. If you are a Malayali, you could learn all of digital in Malayalam, right? What I mean by digital is you know how to run ads in Malayalam, you know how to do analytics in Malayalam, all of that. And when you're learning, English is not the language that is used. Because most of this work is back-end, which means running of ads, analytics and all is back-end, you don't need to face a customer, it does not matter. It does not matter whether you are fluent in English or not. As long as you can read and write English, it's sufficient. We trained 6,000 students across villages, government schools, including Ramakrishna Mission. Ramakrishna Mission tied up with us a year back to change the lives of the polytechnic students because they were not getting jobs. And you know what we do? So next time when you go and apply for a digital marketing course, let's say in Coursera or Manipal, any of these, the trainers are people who are trained by us. They're sitting in some remote village. They're sitting in some remote village in, in Aurangabad, sometimes in, in a village like Kunnur, just using WebEx, just with the power of internet, lives are being changed. They sit at home and make up to 500 rupees per hour and they get to choose how many hours they want to work. Our trainers seated in India in rural villages are training Americans Australians, Swedish people, people in Sri Lanka, everywhere. That's the power of digital. That's how digital is changing lives. Digital is empowering you to decide what's best for you. I know my time is up. So I'm going to close this session by just two things, by saying two things. One is a shloka in Sanskrit that, again, I've grown up learning, and I think all teachers here should, should, should reckon with it, is... Shanashaha kanashash chaiva vidyam artham cha sadhayet. Shanatyage kuto vidyam kanatyage kuto dhanam. And it means a man who wastes any point of his time not acquiring knowledge from others and benefiting from it, thereby loses every opportunity to earn money, a better living, and a better life. So, can we all promise today in this auditorium that we will make ourselves efficient? We will take a risk in life. It's okay. If we win, we will lead. If we fail, we will guide. Somebody else will learn from our, our failures. So digital is a tool in your hands to change the lives not only that exist within you, around you, but those that never even met you. So that's the power of digital. Change, create, experience, survive. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you I'm so not much. sure if anybody has any questions, but if yeah. you do, I'm, I'm always available here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Som. Please, please stay. Please stay. Uh, when I met Dr. Som last time, uh, she actually, you actually inspired by sharing your personal story of struggle. And that's what actually uh, inspired me to aspire for, you know, big things, bigger things in my life. Uh, would you like to share just two minutes sure. your personal story, please? Sure, sure. So I, you know, I started by saying that, uh, you know, how my, I come from a family of doctors, right? And I decided to pursue marketing, so... Very honestly, my dad actually threw me out of the house. I had just 1,000 rupees in my pocket, and that 1,000 rupees I had earned during Durga Puja, when my relatives had given me money for you know, pocket expenses. I took that 1,000 rupees, left home, a cocooned, shelled home. I studied in a convent. 
had the best of life always and finally I was about to pursue my dream where my parents had said, sorry, you don't have our blessings. Uh, I had topped West Bengal board. I, uh, I got an eighth rank in joint entrance, which is, which is very rare and I decided not to pursue medicine. So I left home with 1,000 rupees in my pocket. I took a train. That ticket costed me about 575 rupees. I'm talking about the late 90s. I reached Bangalore via Chennai, and that time you had to change trains. And trust me, once you get in Chennai, nobody knows a word. Even if they know a word, they will not speak to you in anything except for Tamil. So I had to use sign languages, and that's when I started respecting the power of hearing and speaking. It's so important. It's so important to appreciate what you have in life, because that's all I could use to convince somebody to show me where the next station was and everything. I landed in Bangalore. I studied in Mount Carmel. While I got a, a scholarship seat because you know I, I had very good percentage marks, but I had no money to survive. I had absolutely no money to survive. So I went to a paying guest to stay. That paying guest belonged to a Sindhi lady. Um, she, you know, what what really inspired me? Like she said, I inspired her. She inspired me. Uh, she had she had only a piece of land. She had nothing. Uh, her husband was dead. Her son, uh, you know, had, had a physical disability, so she had to run the entire family. She had three other daughters. So she converted that land into a paying guest, and what she did was she had a tailoring shop, she had a beauty parlor, all in that same premises. So I went and I told her that, you know, I'm very good at speaking and convincing people, talking, because I used to write for Telegraph during my school days. Uh, you know, I was a young writer then, and I used to make 500 rupees of stipend. So I knew that I was good at writing, at my creative skills, so can I sit at the beauty parlor? So I would finish college, come from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock, sit at the parlor, talk to clients, upsell products to them, help them with their services. I even learned how to do threading, how to do waxing, because I had no money and I had to survive. I sat at a tailoring shop. I would stitch clothes uh, during the weekend, especially the hemming, doing the fall pico and all of that. And guess what? I had, never, I had never known how to even pick up a needle. I had never entered a kitchen in my life, and I was doing all of that. And I learned how to make homemade chocolates from a girl who would stay in my PG. And I would take those chocolates to my college and sell. Sell them to the girls who could afford to buy them. Because they were gifting their boyfriends and girlfriends on Valentine's Day. I could not even afford to have a boyfriend that time. Because it would be an expensive proposition. I had to gift him something. I had no money. So anyways, I realized one thing in, during that phase. And that's what made me who I am today. Money is nothing. Will is everything. Willpower is everything. No matter which background you come from, let that not decide the life that you're going to lead. Imagine from the background I came from where I was dropped. And then when I topped Bangalore University, after three years, my dad came to meet me. He held me and he cried. And he said, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you because you started respecting. You started respecting every other job in the world, and that's what it takes to be good at what you do. Respect for others, respect for every individual, respect for every job. You never know what will make you sustain. And trust me, doing all those work, I used to make close to five to 6,000 rupees a month, which would pay for my PG, my food, and my books, and everything else. Life is the biggest teacher. You are the biggest learner. Just be open. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you.